way, let's get to the main point of today's talk. It's a great pleasure to welcome Nicolas Moons here today to continue our uh, Massive Star seminar series. Um, Nico actually uh, is now a postdoc at KO Leuven with his main interest being in numerical modeling and uh, physical processes, as you will see during his talk. Uh, he started uh, actually at the University of Antwerp with his bachelor from 2013 to 2016. Then he moved to KU Leuven and has uh, stayed there very close to Massive Stars since then. So he did his master, which he finished in 2018. And then in 2022, he finished his PhD, uh, as you might all know, in the group of uh, Jan Sundquist. He then went to a short postdoctoral stay at the Royal Meteorological Institute in Belgium. Um, but then was so drawn to astrophysics that he actually came back to uh, K.O. Leuven and continued working on the absolute fascinating topic that he will present uh, 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 us today, namely the development of next generation 3D radiation hydrodynamic atmosphere and wind models for hot massive stars. So uh, without further ado, Nico, please uh, take it away. All right, Andreas, thank you. And thank you for having me as well for this seminar. It's a great honor. So indeed, I will be talking about our the next generation of um, atmosphere and wind models that we will be needing for hot massive stars. And, and in, in my opinion, and in the opinion of, of my close collaborators, these next generation of models will need to be 3D models and, and need to properly take into account uh, radiation into this, this 3D um, environment. So before we get into the nice 3D models, I will quickly remind you why we need uh, model atmospheres. So when we make observations of stars, we look at these stars with our telescopes, and from these telescopes, we get this nice spectra. But if we want to then actually do something with these spectra, we need to interpret them. And we do that by fitting these spectra to synthetic spectra that we create from synthetic model atmospheres. Um, and then by finding the closest fits between these, these theoretical models that we have and the observations that we have, we can find best fit parameters for the stellar parameters. And this tells us something about the star that we were observing. Yeah. But so this, this spectral fitting process is very reliant on having model atmospheres. And in the past, people have typically used 1D model atmospheres. And how you make these 1D model atmospheres is you start with a set of stellar parameters, being mass, luminosity, effective temperatures, massless rate, uh, or whatnot. And then for that star, you assume that your um, stellar atmosphere follows some sort of structure. This can be a hydrostatic structure if you're mainly interested in photospheric lines, and this is what the t lusty models do, for example. Or this can be um, an analytic wind structure, such as a beta law, which is used in CMF methods, such as uh, the methods, the models by fast wind or power or CMF gen. And then to efficiently compute these models, these codes assume, or these uh, approaches assume that your wind is steady state and spherically symmetric. And then you can do a detailed radiative transfer calculations on these hydrostatic structures to compute synthetic spectra. And we have an example of that here on the slide on the left, where you see in blue the observation of a, some absorp absorption line of uh, an O4 giant. And if you compute a synthetic uh, spectra from a model, you get this line in green. And you see that the green line doesn't really fit to the blue line. And that is because this assumption of having a steady state wind or, or structure and a spherical symmetric wind structure is not really correct. So what people have been doing, they've been correcting these 1D models with more and more parameters to sort of take into account all of the complex processes that are going on in this atmosphere that, that drives the atmosphere away of being smooth 1D steady state. So examples of this are, are the clumping factors that people talk about, micro and macro uh, turbulent broadening. Sometimes winds don't really follow an analytic beta law, but there's something else going on. There's velocity porosity and, and, and many more um, terms like this. So when you include of all of these corrections, you can make your synthetic spectra a bit better. And that's what you see here in the red line where the, the synthetic spectra is corrected for clumping on the top and where you correct it for some uh, value for the broadening, for the macro-turbine broadening on the bottom. And this works to, to get our spectra clearer and clearer. But the downside of this is that you include more and more parameters in your um, synthetic models, in your, your model atmospheres that make the models more and more complicated without really being more and more correct. You're just adding parameterizations that are not per se physical. 
So in the solar physics community, people are a bit further and already for 20 years, instead of doing parameterized 1D models, they've been running actual full 3D model atmospheres of the sun. Uh, and you see that if you here on, on the right side, you see an a image of one of those 3D simulations of a solar convection cell simulation. And you see that if you synthesize spectra from these complex 3D atmospheres, as compared to a simple 1D model, you get completely different spectra. And that you see on the left where the red line is computed from a 3D simulation and the black dotted line is computed for the sum of a 1D simulation, of a 1D model. Um, and yeah, in, in the solar community, this uh, yeah has, has led to these new solar abundances, the Asplund solar abundances, which are of course very important in that field. Um, of course, people in the solar community have it maybe a bit more easy than us. They can just see the sun and they can see these convective patterns and they don't have to take into account radiation to its full form. They, they very much rely on radiative cooling of their atmospheres, but it's not like in massive stars where radiation force plays a high role. So why do we want to do 3D radiation hydro for massive stars? So 3D is clear, it's the same. Atmosphere and winds are not spherically symmetric. Winds have structure formation. Atmospheres have zones that are very turbulent. Previously, people thought it was convection, but I will show you why that's not the case. And these 3D effects can, atmos can alter both the atmosphere and wind average structure, such as where the effective temperature and photospheric radii lie, and also the, uh, the direct observable, such as um, spectroscopic lines or, or uh, photometric variability. And why do we want to do full radiation hydrodynamics? Well, for massive stars, they're very luminous. Uh, to that point that the dynamics in, in, in uh, massive star atmospheres and winds are really driven uh, by the radiation. So there's important interactions between the gas and, an, and a very complex radiation field, and this is yeah, radiation forces, but also heating and cooling. Okay. So what I want to do in my work, or what the end goal of my work is, is to have a star like, like in the cartoon here, where you have the star with the radiative envelope, then the photosphere, and then a wind on top. And I want to be able to take a box such as this black box that I've uh, drawn here, and then be able to describe what the gas and radiation field is doing in this box. Okay, And that's our idea of having a model for the atmosphere and the wind of the star. So how do we do that? Well, if we want to describe the gas inside of that box, we will have to solve the um, hydrodynamics equations. So these are equations that most of you probably know. These are the equations of continuity, the momentum equation, and the gas equation, which describe conservation of mass, momentum, and density for a gas. And we complement these equations by um, a set of source terms that couple these to the radiation. So first of all, we also have gravity because the gas that we're thinking about is close to the star, so it will be uh, attracted to the star. And second of all, you have these, these source terms that depend on the radiation field. So you have the radiation force that's in these two fields, uh, these two terms and you have the radiative heating and cooling, which will change the energy state of your gas. Okay. These radiation terms, they will um, depend heavily, uh, the source terms, sorry, will depend heavily on the radiation field that you have. And for these massive stars, this radiation field can be very complex, non-isotropic, it can change through time. So it's important if you want to do good, correct radiation hydrodynamics that we also describe this radiation field in its complexities. So, the most complete way that we could do this is by solving the radiation hydro equation, uh, the radiation transfer equation. However, computationally, this is not very feasible because it's an equation that's seven-dimensional. You have you solve for intensities that depend on time, frequency, uh, two angular dimensions, and three spatial dimensions. So computationally, it's just not feasible to solve the radiative transfer equation in its fullest. But what we can do instead is we can integrate this equation over frequency and over angle, so we don't think about those three dimensions. And we are left with the zero moment equation of radiative transfer. And that's the equation that you see here. And what this means, or what this tries to translate, this equation says that the energy stored in your radiation field is also a conserved variable. Um, the advantages of, of doing it with this zero moment equation instead of the full radiative transfer equation, is that it's computationally cheap and feasible to do. And it's correct enough that it captures all of the important dynamics for a massive star atmosphere. A downside maybe is that we don't have spectral info while we do um, our calculations. And, and I'll 
talk later about why that, that might be uh, hard in some other parts. And then to close this uh, radiation field description, we need to make one more assumption and we need to, um, in our simulations, be able to say what the radiation flux will be like to in order to advance our radiation energy equation that you see here. And we do that by means of flux-limited diffusion. And flux-limited diffusion is an analytic approximation that we make that closes mathematically the radiation system, where we say ah, our flux, our radiation flux will behave as um, some constant times the gradient of the radiation energy density field. If we substitute this equation back in here, you see that you're left with the divergence of a gradient, which gives you a diffusion equation. So you describe your radiation field as if it were diffusive. This is an analytic approximation, so we lose some truth in doing this, but it is analytically correct in both the fully diffusive limit and the fully free streaming limit. Um, okay. So FLD, the disclosure that we choose, is not the only way that you can do radiation hydro. Other teams do, do variable Eddington tensor, where they actually um, calculate the closure by solving the radiative transfer equation. Or there are teams that do um, M1 closure, where you also um, through time evolve the radiative flux as a separate variable. But these are both methods that are computationally more expensive than FLD, and we don't really think that they hold much value, much more value in, in, in terms of being true dynamically. So all of this will be almost the last mathematics slide, I promise. All, all of our equations together are here. We have the three hydro equations. We have a complementing um, radiation equation, and we solve these together with a hydrodynamics code MPI AMRFIC, and we can do that so in, in 1D, 2D, or 3D, um, which helps us develop our models quickly. So if we want to do correct radiation hydro, like I said, it's important to have our interaction terms between the gas and the radiation correct. And in order to calculate these interaction terms correctly, well, they rely on some interaction constant and for gas and radiation that are the opacities or absorption coefficients. And since we work with this frequency integrated notation of the, the radiation fields, we also need frequency integrated opacities. And it's not always easy to calculate frequency integrated opacities. When you're deep inside the stellar atmosphere where you're optically thick and, and your radiation behaves very diffusive, we can use Rosland mean opacities. This is the same uh, type of uh, quantification that is used in, um, in stellar structure models. And these Rosland mean opacities are readily tabulated uh, by, by projects such as the OPAL project or LP project, which tabulate Rosland mean opacities as a function of density and temperature. Um, in hot massive stars, for the wind, you have additional effects that are very important. And one uh, important term here is line driving or the sublev effect or CAK theory. And line driving is an enhancement of your opacities due to high velocity gradients. Typically, when people look at, at line driving in stellar winds, they have to parameterize the line driving force with a set of um, line driving parameters. These are the, the Q bars and the alphas or the, the deltas that, that uh, you might have heard about if people talk about CAK theory or MCAK theory. Um, but since I'm so adamant about making our, our models parameter free, we can't really do that in the same way. So instead, what we do is we um, try to calculate our line driving par parameters in the simulation self consistently from the gas quantities that we have at hand. I'm not going to go too much into it, but I have some backup slides into how we do this. So if people are really interested, they can always ask uh, after the, the presentation. Okay, but the important thing is that we manage to get our, our uh, opacities parameter free. Okay, so that's the, the background um, techniques that we use. Now I'm going to dive into some uh, results. I'm going to talk mainly about our most recent results that we've done on O-stars. And then after that, I will talk a bit about some of the work that I've done in my PhD on non free stars. So this is again the cartoon that you saw earlier. So we have this for an O-star, this radiative envelope, which is surrounded by the photosphere. And outside of that uh, is a stellar wind. This is a very simple um, cartoon, and this is also spherically symmetric, as you can see. And thus, I already said that's maybe not fully true. Because in real life, in very luminous O stars, right underneath the photosphere, you actually have this zone which can be turbulent. Um, and it's turbulent because you have locally an increased opacity due to a rise, uh, due to the recombination 
of some uh, iron ions in your uh, atmosphere. So this is a temperature dependent profile uh, process and right underneath the photosphere, the temperature is high enough for iron to recombine, which increases your frequency integrated opacity. And that makes it so that the um, atmosphere right underneath the photosphere becomes dynamically unstable and you create this turbulent zone right underneath the photosphere. Previously, this has been called in literature often the, the subsurface convection zone, but again, I will come back later to why it's not really convection. Um, but yeah, that's that's a term that you might have heard. Um, so then again, we want to um, model this in this box in wind approach where we do a local simulation that includes both the radiative envelope as well as this turbulent zone, the photosphere and the stellar wind. And we do that with this FLT technique that I uh, showed you earlier. So if we do this for a O star of about 60 solar masses with an Eddington factor of about 0 0.1, an Eddington ratio, I say of 0 0.1, meaning that the electron driving radiation force is 10% of the gravitational force, then you get a simulation that looks like this. Um, on the left you see here, so the star you should think is here on the left and the colors decode the logarithm of density. Um, so on the left here, we have this radiative zone. Then you have a zone that is slightly dynamic and the, the photosphere is here as well. And from that zone, you see that the wind starts and you see these black arrows denote the velocity field that gets stronger and stronger the more you get away um, from this photosphere. Um, if we do this now for a star that is a bit more massive and has a bit of a higher uh, Eddington ratio, you see that this story becomes a lot more dynamic. And so again, you have this radiative zone and then you have a, a region that's very dynamically active and very turbulent and there's a lot going on. And then still outside of that, you have the wind. If you think about what a photosphere would look like in this type of uh, simulation that you see here, it's not going to be one static point or one static line. The photosphere will depend a lot on how your density is behaving. And thus your photosphere will be a very dynamic uh, surface, a, a 2D surface in a, in, a, in a 3D simulation or a 1D line that's very dynamic and, and moving in, in this type of slice. Okay. So to relate this back to this cartoon I drew earlier, this is what we have. We have this stable hydrostatic envelope, which is radiatively dominated. We have this turbulent atmosphere. Somewhere here is a photosphere, which will be varying. And outside of that, you have an outflowing wind. And this is nice because this happens at, at 200,000 kilokelvin or a bit higher. And that's exactly where we expect this iron recombination to happen. And so this is exactly where your iron bump is. And so this matches with what we expect from theory. Another way of looking at this uh, simulation is looking at these plots that you see on the right, where we look, where we um, plot as a function of radius on the x-axis, all the densities that you find for a given radial point. And you see that here you have this radiative zone. You only have a very small distribution of densities. But once you get to this turbulent zone and also out in the wind, you have at any given radial point a whole spread of densities that you can find at a, yeah, at a given radial point. And, and this spread can be up to several orders of magnitude big in density space. And the same for the velocity. Right underneath the photosphere, you don't really have a net velocity field, but you do have some, yeah, some some turbulent motion, some uh, equally as much material going up as down again. But then outside of the photosphere, you have a wind that takes off, and it's not again, it's again not one single line, but at every radial point, you have a whole range of possible present velocities in your wind structure. So if we want to quantify this in one D atmosphere, it's going to be very hard. And even if we want to use a two-component medium, which is a, a theoretical description that's often used in, in CMF methods, it's maybe not going to be the most accurate representation of what's actually happening in a stellar atmosphere. Okay, So then we're going to look at a bit at, at um, what is shaping this turbulence and all these dynamics. And I already hinted at it before. It's not convection. So on the left, you see a... Um, energy transport plot for a solar convection cell simulation. And what you have to take away from this plot is that here on the x-axis, zero is a photosphere. And, and uh, to the right is inwards to the star. If you go below the photosphere, about 100% of the energy is transported to convection in solar simulations. If you compare this to what we find in our O stars, at maximum, we find that about 3% of the energy is um, transported through convection in our turbulent atmospheres. 
So the processes between convection zone in the sun and what was previously called the subsurface convection zone in O stars is, is completely different. Eh? Convection is not efficient at all in these subsurface turbulent zones in O stars. So why is that? If you look at the dynamics that are going on on, on these gas parcels, for true convection, like you have it in our sun, you have hot cells that are at the same pressure level, but they're hotter due to some heating. So that means they have a lower density that will make them rise due to buoyancy force. Buoyancy force. Yeah. Once they're on top above the photosphere, they can radiatively cool very efficiently, which makes them cooler, makes them maybe denser, and makes them fall down again. And that's the process of convection in our, in our sun. However, what happens in our simulations, if you look at the dynamics that are going on, we see that cells don't rise because they are less dense and there's no buoyancy force, but instead the cells are slightly hotter, which means that they have a very or, or a quite large increase in their opacity. And that is because at the iron opacity bump, your opacity relies very much on your temperature. If you only have a small change in temperature, you will have a, a bigger change in opacity, and that means a bigger change in radiation driving. So a cell that is slightly hotter will be slightly more opaque. It will be driven up. It only has to cool a very little bit, so that means only give off a, a, a little bit of energy before it becomes back more optically thin and loses its radiative driving and falls down again. And so because you only need to change the temperature or the energy of the gas a small little bit to have a bigger change in opacity, you're not going to be very efficient in transporting energy. Okay? So with that, I want to say that the subsurface convection zone is not convective because it's not driven by buoyancy. The energy transport is negligible in O stars. And also, if we do a linear stability analysis on the structure formation, on which we have a paper that will that's under review now and that will be out soon, um, we see that that the, what we see does not match with real convection. Okay. And in other words, if we then want to correct for this type of behavior in 1D codes, theories like mixing link theory, MLT or MLT++, will not solve this problem. Okay. So they're not, not sufficient to, to describe what we see. What is important, so convection is not important in our O stars. What is important, however, is the pressure that's given by the turbulent regions. So just like how gas pressure is given by the, the motion of, of um, gas on atomic scales, uh, atoms that are moving back and forth, these bigger cells of gas that are moving back and forth with this turbulent velocity also exert a pressure. And this pressure for hot O stars can be sufficient to really alter, alter the, um, the stellar atmospheric structure. Yeah. We can quantify how much this pressure is important by looking at the turbulent velocity parameter, which basically, yeah, um, by taking averages over, over the lateral radius and time, we can, as a function of radius, say how important the uh, this turbulent pressure is as a function of radius. Okay. So, one of the goals of the work that I've been doing recently is trying to figure out how important uh, this turbulent pressure is across the HRB. And because our because that our flux limit diffusion method is so computationally cheap, a 1D model only takes two to three node days to compute, a 3D model a bit more, a few weeks, um, we can cheaply compute a whole grid of, of, of O-star models. So here I've done that for 36 models only in 2D and uh, masses range between 50 and 75 solar masses. And what I've been doing is I've been looking at how turbulence alters the, um, yeah, the photosphere or the stellar structure throughout the HRD. Okay. So what we find is that if you look at this typical turbulent velocity values that you find as a function of luminosity, which I've plotted in this figure um, from increasing to the left side, you see that there's a very clear relation between how high your turbulent velocity is and how high your luminosity is. So more luminous stars are going to have more of this turbulent velocity and thus more of this turbulent pressure. And this matches very well with observations that people have made of a macro turbulent broadening um, of spectroscopic lines for high luminosity stars. So what's plotted in this figure is uh, macro turbulent broadening velocities for a sample of stars by Sergio Simon Diaz. Um, and again, not as a function of, of stellar luminosity, but this is some sort of uh, gravity-weighted flux, which uh, correlates with luminosity linearly. We see again that stars that are more luminous have a higher macro-turbulent velocity. And even the values of the, the macro-turbulent velocity and the 
turbulence that we find match on order of magnitude. So these are between 0 and 120 kilometers per second, and we have the same between 0 and, and roughly 100. OK. Why is that the case? Well, it's it's not hard to imagine that if you have a photosphere that's, that's very turbulent, all this motion will incite, yeah, there, there will be velocity fields at the photosphere where the photospheric lines are created, and thus these velocity fields will broaden your spectral lines. And that's the same that the people in the solar community found, because you have all these convective cells that are moving back and forth, you have velocity fields at the photosphere, and these broaden your spectral lines. So we can do the same for our O-stars. We can look at what a the photosphere will look like. And this is a, a simulation, a, a 3D simulation of an O-star that we've post-processed with a radiative transfer solver. And what you see here, I'm going to play it again, is the photospheric surface. And what you have to take away is that this is a very dynamic, um, high motion uh, sort of photosphere, right? And all of this motion will, of course, broaden your lines. We can try and quantify this broadening by comparing what radiative, what, what uh, yeah, a synthetic spectral line from a structured simulation will look like as compared to a synthetic line that we compute from the average structure of such simulation. So here in the in the top panel, you see a, a snapshot of our one of our two uh, D simulation, and in the bottom panel, you see the average of a bunch of snapshots that we took of our two D simulations, and so. The idea is that that uh, the bottom is smooth and, and you sort of wash out all the, the structure formation and the turbulence. And the top one, you have a lot of turbulence and a lot of velocity fields that are very complex going on. And if you just do a simple radiative transfer calculation on these two uh, different snapshots, you find that, again, this smooth static atmosphere will give, of course, a very thin absorption line and this very structured high velocity um, type of snapshot will broaden your line very much. And we can sort of quantify this broadening by, by um, convolving this thin profile with some uh, width Gaussian to get this um, blue profile. And if you, and we can quantify this broadening with a broadening parameter, which has units of velocity. And if you do that, you f and if we do that for all of the stars in our, uh, our 36 star sample, for a bunch of different lines, we find that we uh, see a very nice linear relation between the turbulent velocities that we find in our stars and the broadening parameters needed to explain this spectral line broadening. Yeah. So this is not exactly your macro turbulent velocity, but this is a quantity that's very closely related to what the macro turbulent velocity would be. So the takeaway from this is that our models are giving us predictive power over broadening parameters. So hopefully in the near future, um, if you give us stellar parameters, we can give you what the macrotopolent broadening would be instead of trying to fit for that, which is of course very beneficial if you try to um, get yeah, stellar parameters from a, from a spectra. Okay. We have a very nice confirmation of that is this working by looking at, at the magnetic stars. So here we see three spectral lines of three different stars. It's all the same uh, atomic transition, but for three different stars. And the top two are from stars that have a very low magnetic field. And the bottom one is of a star that has a very high magnetic field, about 20 kilogauss as a dipole. And you see that the bottom spectral line is a lot thinner than the top two lines. The, the bottom line also has some width, but this is mostly due to Zeeman broadening. And the uh, Top two lines, they are macro turbulently broadened or broadened by turbulence. And this matches very well with if we try to run our 2D uh, O star simulations with magnetic fields, we see that the magnetic fields sort of cancel out the turbulence. So here we have density plots for on the left, a zero magnetic field star. And then going to the right, we have um, you know, one kilogauss, 10 kilogauss, 20 kilogauss on the top row vertical and on the bottom row horizontal field. And especially if you look at the um, bottom panels, you see that the horizontal field is very efficient at blocking uh, the turbulent motion. And that makes sense. It's the magnetic pressure that doesn't like velocity fields, that doesn't like gas that moves transcendentally to the magnetic fields. So magnetic fields block um, this turbulent motion, and it gives us a nice observational confirmation that at least we're onto something with our models. And we see that also it's at exactly 20 or 10 kilogauss 
that this broadening is, is almost completely suppressed and that's the same value of these magnetic stars. Okay, this is also work that's gonna be, that's under revision and that will hopefully be published soon. So the last reason why you should care about uh, multi-D models in O stars is that when you do simple 1D hydrostatic models of uh, O stars, they're often artificially inflated. And this is because when you go over the iron bump, your scale height increases, your, your, yeah, your Eddington factor comes close to unity, which means that your scale height increase and this will artificially inflate your, um, your stellar envelope lots. And we're pretty sure that this is not really a physical effect because when we look at this in a 2D or a 3D simulation, we see that your, star, your uh, atmospheric structures start to form, your um, atmosphere becomes unstable. And if you compare a purely 1D inflated hydrostatic model to a 2D model, we see that in a 2D model, our atmosphere sort of deflates quite a lot because it doesn't go through this unphysical uh, high scale height phase as a function of radius. And so we have the density profile as a function of radius, and we see that these 1D dotted models are a lot inflated as compared to our 2D models or the average uh, density profile in our 2D models. Which means also, of course, that your photosphere is a lot deeper in the star, which means that your temperature profile will also cool faster and your temperature profile will also be um, adapted. So in this sense, we see that from these 2D models, yeah, it's important to take into account multi-D effects to compute um, stellar structure at, at the outer boundary. Okay. If we see how much these atmospheres deflate again over our full HRD diagram, then we can see that for the very high mass, very luminous stars, this can be up to 40% change in uh, photospheric radii. And if we look at how much this affects the effective temperature, we see that these very massive luminous star can be up to 30% hotter if you look at a 2D model as compared to a very simple radiative inflated 1D model. Okay. So conclusions on the O stars. I hope I convinced you that multi-D star models, uh, yeah, multi-D models are important. They show turbulent subphotospheric layers. They are not convective. These turbulent properties are important both in atmosphere and wind structure, also in synthesizing observables. And these multi-D RHD models predict smaller photospheric radii and hotter effective temperatures, which can be important outer boundary conditions for stellar structure calculations. And hopefully in the near future, we can um, yeah, tell you what type of turbulent pro properties we predict based on uh, stellar input parameters. Okay, so that was it on O stars. Now I'm gonna go back in time for me at least and talk a bit about what I did during my PhD for Wolf Rea stars. So in my PhD, I mainly researched on Wolf Rea stars and why are Wolf Rea stars important? Well, you all seen this figure. This is the, the life cycle of a massive star and Wolf Rea stars are sort of the last phase in a massive star's life before they go supernova. Okay. And yeah, Wolf Rea stars, have a very strong stellar wind. My presentation is crashing a bit. Yeah, okay. Wolf Rea stars have a very strong uh, stellar wind and thus un understanding the winds of these Wolf Rea stars is important for understanding the black hole graveyard that we can measure now with LIGO, which can help us tune uh, cell revolution calculations, but also for the, chem uh, the chemical and dynamical feedback that stars have on the galaxy. Um, so unlike solar like stars and O stars, which have a nice, which are easy to see as a nice star, and then you have the photosphere, and then you have a wind that takes off after that, Will Freya stars are morphologically quite different. Um, and Will Freya stars are characterized by their very strong wind. Um, and the wind is so strong that it's actually hard to see through the wind up until the stellar surface. So the, the photosphere that we see for Will Freya stars is actually shrouded quite far away from the hydrostatic core and it's in the wind of the star. Okay, so here I try to draw on this cartoon on the right. I used all of my artistic skills to show that you have the star here and then you have the wind that takes off from this, this darker blob and the photosphere is somewhere uh, in, in, the, in the wind there. Okay, for O stars, we understand very well how, how the wind works, how it's driven, and that's this line driving CAK theory that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. But for Wolf Rea stars, um, 
it's a bit more complex than just line driving. So we've tried to understand this uh, with 1D models, but they don't really give us a satisfiable explana explanation because the solutions that we get for 1D winds often rely on, on what kind of parameterizations you use to do 3D effects. So if you change your clumping or your turbulent parameters, it will hugely affect um, the solution that you get for your wind. So in my PhD, I, I went about just uh, modeling this from, from, from the beginning, doing full 3D models of these uh, wolf ray atmospheres and winds. And uh, what you see here is a snapshot of a simulation of a 2D slice of such a simulation for a wolf ray star, where we model the 10 solar mass, one solar radius wolf ray star. So they're, they're on the quite low end of uh, classical wolf ray star masses. And what you see is the in the top panel, the density, the radial velocity, and uh, the lateral velocities of such a simulation. And what I want to show with this panel is that yeah, the, the atmospheres and the winds of these stars are very dynamic, very structured, and there's a lot going on. Okay. So how does this wind look like? On the left, I show you what the relative density of such a, a snapshot from such a wolf ray wind looks like. So um, at the bottom, you have the stellar core. Then you have the wind that's being launched from the stellar core, which is optically thick. Then you have sort of the, the photosphere, which is shrouded in the wind. And then outside of that, you have more wind and, and more structure formation going on. What you see here in the color scheme is the, the relative density. So over densities are indicated in blue and under densities in dark red. And what you see for these type of stars is that, um, well, first of all, it's not it's again not a two-component medium that is, is often assumed in, in CMF codes, such as power or fast wind or CMF gen. But instead, it's more of a smooth distribution in density. So it's not that you have a low density base and clumps upon that. No, it's it's really a smooth distribution in densities and velocities. And if you look close to the wind, you see uh, close to the, the base of the wind, or so, so close to the launching point of the wind, you see that most of the mass is stored in these over-dense properties of the winds, while most of the momentum for this lower part of the wind is stored in the low-density gas. Yeah, And for the upper part of the wind, so in the outer wind, you have the, the same for the mass. So most of the mass is, again, in these what, what people used to call clumps. But most of the momentum is also in those clumps, in, in uh, contrast to at the bottom. OK? So. What's different here than in O stars is that the wind is already launched over the, the opal opacity bump, over this iron opacity bump. So in the O stars, this caused this turbulence, but it didn't really launch the wind. The wind was the wind was only launched off the photosphere. But for the Wolfreya stars, the wind is already launched um, below the photosphere over this um, opacity bump. And then in the outer part of the wind, the opacity bump is gone, so you're mostly dominated by CAK line driving, one would normally say. But if you look closer at the type of opacities that you find in this outer part of the wind, you see that these clumps, where most of the mass is in, is actually not line driven at all. It's way too dense to efficiently be driven by, by CAK theory or by, by Sobolev uh, driving. Yeah. What's happening instead is that the medium in between these high density uh, regions is accelerated very much by line driving. And it's actually the ram pressure of this low density gas on the high density blobs, if you want to call them like that, that accelerates the wind. So it's a very, it's an intrinsically 3D process. It's the acceleration of this low density gas and then the ram pressure from this low density gas on the high density um, blobs that, that drives the wolf ray wind. Okay, so the, the process of driving a wind is not just normal line driving, but it's really, you need the structure formation at the bottom over the iron opacity bump. You need also the launching of the wind there. And then you need, outside of the photosphere, the low density gas that needs to be accelerated over line driving, which then um, crashes into the high density, slower clumps to accelerate them via ramp pressure. Okay. If you look at, at the morphology of these wolf ray winds, you see again that they're a bit different than um, from these O-stars. And that's what I said before. You, If I indicate the photosphere here with this blue dotted line, 
you see this is the sorry yeah this panel shows the velocities again that you see as a function of radius so again you see that there's at any given point many velocities possible and so here is the zero so you see that from the the starting point of the wind which is well below the photosphere your wind already takes off and it already has a certain velocity once it reaches the photosphere this is in stark contrast with O stars where you first have this turbulent zone and then the wind takes off afterwards. If we now lower the luminosity for these type of stars, we see actually that when we model a wolf ray star with a reasonably low luminosity, we sort of recover the same type of morphology as the wind for, for O stars, where we again have this first constant or, or net zero velocity field where you have a lot of turbulence or a lot of velocity fields that go faster and slower, so, so net you have no velocity. And then after the photosphere, this blue dotted line, you have the wind that takes off, so the velocity that rises. Um, so like I showed earlier, this is the plot for the O star that I showed earlier. It's a very similar at first flat, wait, my course, yeah, first flat and then rising velocity field. Yeah. However, if you look at the, the stellar parameters that this corresponds to, well, it's, it's a, a wolf ray star with a lower luminosity. So basically this corresponds to these stripped O stars or stripped B stars or, or these hot sub dwarfs um, that have been recently identified by, by uh, Godberg. Um, and so we can sort of extrapolate from this and say, well, if you can change from this, yeah, so the, the important difference between these two, actually, I should stress, is that these winds are optically thick driven in the beginning and these winds are purely optically thin. And so we can sort of extrapolate from this that if you can change from a classical Wolf Ray star kind of wind to a sub dwarf kind of wind by just lowering the luminosity, maybe we can do the same and go from a optically thin O star wind to an optically thick O star wind by again um, raising the Eddington factor or raising the luminosity. And we think that this is maybe the, or we want to extrapolate this and say that this is the um, mechanism that launches uh, WNH, so hydrogen-rich Wolf Ray winds, or these very massive star winds. And that means that if your um, wind launching mechanism change, this will also change your mass loss rate recipe or, or the, the way that your mass loss rates work. And that would be helpful in explaining the, the whole idea of the thinking, where you find higher or relatively high mass loss rates for uh, very massive stars. But we're not there yet, so that's for next time. So I want to end then by, by giving my conclusions to Paulindo, where I just want to recap that multidimensional effects are important for synthesizing observationals, uh, for synthesizing observables. Multi-team modeling can be important and helpful in just understanding the very complex physics that goes on in the atmospheres and winds of massive stars. And hopefully in the near future, we can also get some feedback from these multi D metal models to gauge 1D models by giving us uh, clumping parameters and whatnot. All right, thank you. That was it for me. Thank you very much, Nico, for a very nice and very comprehensive talk. I'm pretty sure there will be uh, some questions from our audience to, uh, to your talk. So please raise your hands uh, and then um, I can ask people to unmute. Okay, I see Joris already has a question. Joris, please go ahead. Hello, can Hello, you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh my god, oh my there's god. an echo. Sorry, one second. Elisa, can you play? All right, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, thanks, Nico, for the really nice uh, seminar talk. Um, I had two things I wanted to ask, or actually, it was one more, one question and one comment. Um, so the question is about this uh, fake convection thing. So maybe if you go go back to one of those slides, you said something like um, it's it's not something you could implement as MLT or MLT++ in like a one-dimensional code. And yeah. I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on why that is. And I mean, I understand it's a different mechanism, but why isn't there some sort of equivalent that you could do in a 1D code? So yeah, we we have to come up with an equivalent. That's the thing. Um, there, there are people that, that try to use MLT for this as it's impl implemented now in, in Stellar Structure Code, and that's that's just not a correct thing to do. Um, MLT at its core is, is an energy transport mechanism. And we see that for these O-stars, for at least for this outer turbulent zone, 
the important component is not the convective energy transport, but the important ingredient there is the turbulent pressure. So if we want to take that into account in, 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 in stellar structure models, we have to come up with a, a, an alternative for MLT that translates um, turbulent pressure to 1D models. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it can basically, even though the energy transport is small, it could still have an effect on the tr structure, basically. It's Not the energy transport, the turbulent pressure will. Turbulent pressure will, yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay, um, and then the second thing uh, was slide 40, um, 40. Uh, this really caught my attention because um, this plot, uh, the, the 2D line that you show is very similar to some of my power models using a deep um, connection point to the in interior, where we basically model uh, over the iron bump, um, but then cut off the, the Eddington parameter. At, after, uh, so, it, you know, you don't have super Eddington um, layers. And it also basically avoids this inflation. And then... Uh, yeah, we have a paper coming up hopefully soon um, where we sort of explore that yeah. uh, the different spectra that that uh, makes. So I found it really interesting that you also have this uh, in the two D models. Yeah, that will be yeah it would be very interesting to see because that's exactly what you what you would have to to correct for right. You don't have this this artificially increased increased scale height, so you have to cut it off somewhere. Um, but then importantly, also an additional effects. Other than than all than just not inflating, we also find that you due to this turbulent pressure, you have sort of a a density gradient that becomes less steep because you have this additional um, pressure term, mm -hmm. which which fights your, your your local gravity, right? So your scale height increases a bit due to that, but not as much that that you inflate completely. So to do this correctly, it would be indeed very interesting to see exactly and then to gauge where you have to cut off um, this super Eddington region. Cool, I'd be interested in seeing that. So we can definitely discuss more in the future. That'd be really nice. Okay, well, thank you. That, that was it for my side. Andreas, we have four questions. Andreas, I, I think, think we can mute. hear you, Andreas. Mute us, Andreas. Andreas, unmute. Maybe yo, you can just uh, point someone to ask a question in the meantime, or I will. I will ask my question. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry, uh, Gloria. Next, then Joe. No, thank you. you. Then you. Yes, just Gloria was before me. Thank you. Thank you for this very really illuminating talk. Uh, I've always thought 3D is needed. And uh, my particular, my specific question has to do with your slides 36 and 37. You're close by. Okay, so your line profile. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how that line profile is formed. I'm particularly curious about the fact that you seem to have a more extended red wing which uh, has to do with the material that's flowing downward. Is this an opacity effect or how does this um, come about? Yeah, so so first of all, to, to say that these are really line profiles is maybe a bit of a an uh, exaggeration. I, I did here a very simple, purely radial integration of the of the radiative transfer equation. And what I do in, in the bottom figure is I turn off all of the velocity fields. So also I ignore the wind here because we're working with a photospheric line um, and I want to compare just the pure static smooth atmosphere to the um, the blue line, which is, uh, to yeah, to the blue line, uh, which has this, this, first of all, the wind, but also clumps going uh, up and down through this photospheric region. And so indeed the fact that your line shifts, sh uh, the line center shifts a bit is, not only uh, due to the fact that you have the wind in the blue line and not in the orange line, but also due to the fact that you have, yeah, denser, the, the inflowing material is probably denser than the outflowing material. Yeah, so uh, that means that the, the absorption will be 
um, more affected by infalling material because there's more density there. Yeah, and that will explain the, the shift towards the the lower wavelengths. No, no, but I'm 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 curious. Okay, but but well, what you have is a more extended red wing, which is indeed the material that's that's falling. So the material that's falling seems to have a uh, a different, a very different velocity distribution. Let's put it that way. Yeah, so, so the, the rising uh, material and the falling material have very different yeah. uh, velocity distributions. Yeah, yeah. So, so how I understand it is that the inflowing material is is in general more dense and maybe slower, but the outflowing material is there's yeah less dense and maybe faster, right? So. Okay. It's a, I, as I understand, it's a change in that distribution that that um, makes the line profile asymmetric. Okay, thank you very much. There you go. Okay, then Yorick next. Hi, uh, Niklas. Uh, very interesting. Could, could you go back to the slide about the um, the momentum and the uh, mass uh, for the wolf ray? Yeah. yeah, you had the inner wind, the outer wind. Yeah, and I didn't understand. Um, <clears throat> something yeah um so yeah so if in the inner wind most of the mass is in the clumps right and we're in the inner wind so the velocity should be low why is most of the momentum then in the low density i don't i think i'm missing something still so that, that's um relatively at, at that point if you look only at the mm -hmm. um inner wind so, oh, ah, okay, I, I understand the question. What that means is that relatively the low density gas is a lot faster uh -huh. than the, the high density gas. Yeah, so most of the, the momentum. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Is, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, okay. yeah, okay. Is that so it's low, low uh, sorry, it, it, it's faster material, but it's faster, still, yeah, still indeed. Slow. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. The difference in, in, in velocity is higher, lower down than ever up there. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. So, so what is the velocity there then? Is this like five columns per second? In in values? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> I, oh, wait, wait, we can look at the, the plots right, can, yeah. here maybe. So this is in uh, hundreds of kilometers per second, so below the photosphere. Well, yeah, you have, you have a whole spread again, right? But it can be up sure. to 500 kilometers per second uh, at, at average, I'd say. Oh, okay. So that's quite fast. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay, Joe next. Hello, Nico. This was a very, uh, by the way, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. This was a very nice talk and brought uh, a lot of new stuff, which might tell us that all what you have done the last 30 or 40 years is not so correct, <laughs> but let's see. But particularly, I was also interested in your finding about this deflation effect for the O stars. So maybe we have to think about whether how one can prove this or disprove this, because that's a very interesting effect. And particularly, maybe it might be also related indirectly, for instance, to this mass discrepancy problem. So, yeah, good. So that was one point. But I, I my, my comment is a different story. Namely, two times in your talk, you mentioned uh, that the structure of, or your uh, the structure found by you is not a two-component medium as it is assumed in more or less all the codes nowadays. But, of course, there is a reason for this two-component medium that we are assuming, which has to do, as you, uh, as you know, with the line-driven instability, which is admittedly only in the, say, intermediate and outer wind, which is of no concern currently. But anyhow, you have calculated this, and of course, you have used also opacities which come from the Sobolev uh, approximation. So my question would be, if at some point we are able to include the LDI, what do you think? Are the current instabilities already fast enough to, uh, how to say, to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, make the major effect? Or might a strong LDI still change the R structure in the outer wind going back or coming back to a two-component medium? Thank you for the question. Yeah, that's a very good question. And that's also a very hard question to, <laughs> to answer without just guessing. But what I can say is that even with the LDI, if you perform multi-D simulations, 
and you look at these density distributions in multi-D LDI simulations, yeah. that the whole two-component medium thing also starts to break down. Yeah, it's, that's true, yeah. In 1D simulations, that's fine. But but if you go to 2D or 3D LDI simulations, that's that's not as true as, as, uh, yeah. as much anymore. Okay. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay, Paco was next. Hi, uh, it was a great, really great talk. I was <clears throat> I was going to ask, uh, ask something that uh, Joe just mentioned at the beginning and it's related to all this turbulence and its relation to the proper mass discrepancy. And uh, uh, so you get the, the, the larger the luminosity, the larger the, the turbulence. And do you get the more or less I uh, mass discrepancy removed using these things? And the second question is, according to your calculations, uh, the uh, stars with uh, a high uh, magnetic fields should be should not have a mass discrepancies because the, then the tubulus is really suppressed. So is that something you have investigated? Um, the, the second part, no, not at all. It's a very good point, actually, that you make. It would be very interesting to check. Um, but for the first part, yes. Uh, we're, and so maybe for other people where the, where the mass discrepancy comes in here, this turbulent pressure changes your, um, your, your scale height at the photosphere, and thus that changes your spectroscopic uh, fitting of, of the log G, right? If I understand correctly, and, and that will yeah. change the mass that you infer, and also that with the radius will change the mass that you infer. Um, so we've been working with, with uh, Andreas's group, actually, with, with uh, Gemma, who's been looking at including this turbulent pressure in power models and looking at how that actually changes the fitted log G values that you get from, from, uh, from fitting spectra. And, and indeed, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Andreas, but we are going in, in the correct direction that, that you change the, yes. or at least make the mass discrepancy less strong um, by including this turbulent pressure. Okay, thanks. That would uh, be satisfying. It. Yeah. yeah. yeah con congrats for the uh, really nice talk. Thank you. Okay, I see Gloria has a, uh, another question. Well, if there's time, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on what what you think might happen if you include rotation? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a very good question. So that's actually directly in, in, in the follow-up line of work that I plan on doing is I'm, I'm very interested in, in seeing how the how angular momentum is, is transported over this, this turbulent region. Yeah. Um, yeah, first of all, okay, rotation will also, of course, change your, your uh, atmospheric structure. But also, is if you assume your your radiative core to be completely solid body rotating, will that that angular momentum transform also in a solid way to the photosphere, or will your photosphere rotate slower than your than your um, um, radiative core? And that's that's a good question, and and uh, I'm, I do plan on, on looking at that in the in the very near future. So stay tuned. I would say, not gonna make any guesses in advance. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess in, in, in this in this area, uh, whatever you predict is probably going to be wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, if there are no more further questions, then thank you very much again uh, to Nico for a really wonderful talk. And I think it was really inspiring on what to work on. Um, there uh, will be, of course, further uh, Massive Star uh, G2 seminars uh, next year. Um, I don't think we have a December slot at the moment, but uh, you will definitely hear all of the updates uh, via our typical email list. So please make sure you're subscribed to the Massive Star newsletter if you haven't done so. Um, otherwise, uh, see you next time. And thank you very much for attending. And of course, thank you very much, Nico, for your excellent presentation. Thank you, thank you for having me.